In Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl you can get seven different endings, depending on how the game is played and what decisions are taken. In this video I will show you all endings, what requirements you need to fulfill in game to get them and the explanations or rather interpretations since a view endings are quite difficult to understand and leave you with a big question mark in your head. The seven endings can be roughly divided into two categories. Five of the seven are wrong or bad endings. The other two could be described as true, though thanks to Stalker Call of Pripyat we know that the better ending, the good one, is the actual canon ending. So the other one would be more of a neutral ending. Let's start with the five bad endings. All of them have to do with the wish granter which can be discovered in the final mission of the game. Once the player arrives at the Chernobyl power plant, a fight between the incoming military and the monolith forces that guard the NPP starts. The player is in the crossfire of both sides and has to fight them to reach the entrance of the building and that, before a timer runs out, that announces a huge emission which would kill everyone still outside. My advice? Stay close to the wall. First the one that's on the left when the player enters the level and then once you reach the building itself, always stay very close to it. Eventually you will reach an entrance to your right. Just be careful to avoid all the bullets and the one or other anomaly on the way there. Once you are inside the building, you start to hear the wish granter calling you. Follow the radiated hallways filled with dozens of well-equipped monolith fanatics until you reach a staircase. Walk up and then turn left. Once you have to turn right for the first time, you will find a small entrance way somewhere on the right wall, which is marked on the minimap. The first thing you see are the many graphite blocks lying around everywhere, and a few steps further you can see that we stand directly inside the reactor where the accident happened in 1986. Climb up the ladder and once you reach the top, you can see the wish granter. Since it seems like we have forgotten how to climb without a ladder, we have to go through the portal that brings us to the start of a small jumping puzzle. It's not that hard to beat, but you still shouldn't be over encumbered to have enough energy to jump. The way was kindly marked by someone with multiple campfires. He probably ran out of paint. Eventually you will stand in front of the wish granter and can activate it. Now one of five endings will play and which one that is was already decided by your decisions in the game. Here is a chart that shows what requirements have to be fulfilled for each of the endings. As you can see that depends on three factors. How much money do you have? What is your reputation within the zone? You can look that up under statistics in your PDA and are the faction leaders of duty and freedom alive or dead. For the wealth ending you just need more than 50,000 ruble. That automatically terminates the possibility to get any of the other four bad endings. For the immortality ending you need to have less than 50,000 ruble. Your reputation must be between excellent and terrible and at least one faction leader must be alive. For the no zone ending you need to have less than 50,000 ruble and your reputation must be excellent. It doesn't seem to matter if the faction leaders are dead or alive. For the world domination ending you must have less than 50,000 ruble, any reputation other than excellent and both faction leaders must be dead. For the control humanity ending you must have less than 50,000 ruble, a terrible reputation and the faction leaders have to be alive. 
I have tested most of these requirements myself, so they should work. I want to be rich. Getting so much money isn't that hard, which makes this ending probably the most achieved ending in the whole game. But so much money wasn't enough for Strelok. He wanted to be rich and the wish granter started to fulfill his wish in a very abstruse way. Once Strelok expressed his wish, the roof slowly started to get unstable and pieces of it started to rain down. But the wish granter didn't let Strelok see screws and bolts, but gold coins. So many until the roof couldn't be held up anymore and came crashing down. Strelok was literally buried under his greed for material things. I want immortality. Just like before, the wish granter fulfilled Strelok's desire in a rather unpleasant way. His body started to transform into a metal statue and is with that neither living nor dead. Another interpretation would be that a statue, which is raised for a person, normally honors the person's achievements and deeds and makes him or her immortal. In this way, the person itself might not be immortal, but their names, the doings of their lifetime and their memories will live on long after their death. Another possibility that came into my mind while writing the script is probably the most cruel one. Strelok may be a metal and immovable statue, but he is still conscious and can perceive everything that happens around him, but is not able to do anything. And since he has no flesh anymore that could rot away, he's damned to live on as a conscious lump of metal, standing there for all eternity. I want the zone to disappear.
Strelok wishes for the zone to disappear and he suddenly stands in a green field and trees grow around him. It seems that it worked and he closes his eyes to enjoy the peaceful surroundings and nature and he seems to finally be happy. However, once he opens his eyes after a few seconds, they are white and pale and anxious surprise overcomes his face. The wish granter made him blind and since he can't see anything anymore, the zone disappeared, at least for him. That he seems to be standing in a green field, feeling the warm sun on his face and hearing birds is probably just an illusion from the wish granter, as it was the case in the wealth ending. You could say that his wish was fulfilled in a pretty harmless way this time, since Strelok now knows that something isn't right because of his blindness. The wish granter could have just let him believe that the zone really did disappear and let him walk around in this illusion until he stumbles into an anomaly or get ripped apart by a mutant. Or would that be the better option? Walking around in peace and then get killed suddenly may be better than just stumbling around blind and helpless in the probably most dangerous place on earth, knowing that it's just a matter of time until something kills him. I want to rule the world. To understand this ending even in the slightest, you have to know what happens right before one of the true endings. Otherwise, the sudden levitating in the air, glowing in the blue light and then vanishing seems to have nothing to do with ruling over the world. At the true endings, you learn that the zone was created by a group of scientists who created a common consciousness. We are the result of an experiment aimed at creating a super-consciousness called Sea Consciousness. The consciousnesses of seven volunteers were connected during the experiment leading to the creation of the super-consciousness that is us. I don't want to digress too much from the topic of this video, so I keep myself short and just say that the wish granter was created by said Sea Consciousness and is also con connected to it. Everything you have said about the monolith is true. All of it. It is just an illusion manufactured in a lab next to the sarcophagus. When the wish granter sends out an impulse and Strelok vanishes, it may imply that he was absorbed by it and is now somewhat part of the sea consciousness. In the official wiki page it is said that the sea consciousness seeks to rule the world and since Strelok is now part of it, he is also part of the plan for world domination. The thing is, the scientist group never said anything about having ambitions to rule the world and the initial goals could even be described as altruistic, but more to that later in the video. The Sea Consciousness said that they subjected the group of scientists immediately after they were created. We immediately subordinated those who were conducting the experiment and assigned them to tasks we needed them to carry out. So one could say that they might have other plans than the scientists. But right after that, the Sea Consciousness say that they also have the same goals. Our main goal was to make small adjustments to the noosphere allowing us to remove things like anger, cruelty, greed and other negative factors from the planet. So the only explanation I have is that the way the sea consciousness tries to better humanity also could be used to enslave or control them, which would make world domination at least possible.
Humanity is corrupt. Mankind must be controlled. Okay, uh, explaining that will be quite difficult. On the one hand, because it's the ending with the biggest room for interpretations, and on the other, because the translation says control humanity, but originally it's destroy humanity, according to the official wiki page. And I will stay with the official explanation, which says that the pictures of barren landscapes, death, destruction and nuclear explosions, Strelok sees in his head, leave two possibilities. The first is that the wish altered history itself and the world and its inhabitants already died. And the second is that he could have a glimpse into the future and the certainty that humanity destroys itself. While the second theory does have some plausibility to it, it doesn't explain why he is surrounded by darkness but more to that later. The first theory, however, is not possible for multiple reasons. First, the ability to alter time and history itself would need an enormous amount of power, which would also make it very easy to achieve world domination. The sea consciousness, and with that also the wish granter, however, couldn't do that until now, so they lack the power to change the past. Well, provided that the sea consciousness actually wants to achieve world domination, because their original goals would also be possible with that much power. And on another note, the sea consciousness wants to either rule over humanity or wants to better it. So why would they grant someone the wish to destroy the world and with that every living being? Here the translation to control humanity would be more fitting. Like I said before, it's the ending with the biggest room for interpretations, and the last sentence in the wiki, which provides another explanation, gave me an idea. In this explanation it is described that Strelox gets transferred all the knowledge and the complete history of humanity into his brain. So he controls humanity because he has the whole of humanity in his head. This explanation is a bit strange and I'm not even sure if I understand it right, but the transfer of so many informations and pictures into Strelok's brain could be the crucial explanation to what really happened. In the other four endings, Strelok's wish was always granted in such an abstruse way that one could argue that his wishes weren't really fulfilled. He didn't get rich, he didn't become immortal, he doesn't rule over the world and the zone also didn't cease to exist. He was always killed, at least somehow. Every execution of his wish only affected him and no one else. And he was fooled multiple times through illusions as if his wish actually worked. Putting all this knowledge into this ending, it could be that the pictures of death and destruction are just an illusion again to fool him into thinking that humanity got wiped out. And since he's also a human, he wished for his own death, so he's stuck in the void, a place between life and death. Or at least he could think that he's there. While Strelok thinks that all of this happened, his brain might be overloaded with all the data and knowledge that streams into his head. The brain could be described as a biological supercomputer but even a supercomputer has a limit to the amount of data it can store and process. The sudden overload of all this data could have sent Strelok into an immediate shock or coma, and in truth he's collapsed in front of the wish granter. 
But why would he see himself surrounded by darkness then? I mean, humanity still exists, so he can't be trapped in the void. My explanation for that would be that he just thinks that he's physically standing there while he actually dreams. When we are awake, we know that we really are awake, but as soon as we are inside a dream, we suddenly can't determine that we are sleeping. In the majority of cases, we believe that we actually experience that dream, unless it's a lucid dream. I also had some dreams where I knew I was dreaming, and you can even learn to do that. In Strelok's case, however, it wouldn't make any difference if he can lucid dream because his overloaded brain is not able to display anything other than himself. His body is in a comatic state after the overload, and if he knows what happened or not doesn't make any difference. He's trapped in the emptiness of his head, until after some time his body dies, and with that his brain also ceases to function. Trapped in the emptiness of his head. Multiple people seem to have this problem. Uh, doesn't matter. I just thought of a way to make it even worse. His body just lays there and he can't eat and drink which would eventually kill him. The rough estimate how long a human can survive without water is about three days, but considering multiple factors it could be up to one week. That's the time he would be trapped in the darkness, but a perception of time can be quite different while dreaming. After a 5 minute google search I learned that dreams are perceived in real time, but I had the feeling, multiple times now, that some of my dreams were going on for hours while in reality far less time has passed. The movie Inception worked with a similar principle as far as I remember. There the time seemed to pass a lot faster inside a dream. This would mean that the few days Trilog still has could feel like months or even years for him that he has to spend alone in the dark nothingness he's in. I'm no neurobiologist and I have relatively little knowledge how all this stuck inside your own head even as possible when your brain is large, largely unfunctional. I just don't know how much you can explain logically here anyway when you have to do it with something near magical like the wish granter. Maybe someone of you already have noticed some mistakes in my explanations and interpretations to the endings. Alright, that were a lot of ifs and coulds and so on. But more than just interpretation isn't possible with these endings. With what you can be sure though is that the wish granter isn't that almighty monolith that can fulfill your every wish. It corrupts every expressed wish and twists it to the utmost, to the misfortune for everyone who is foolish enough to wish for something. All these endings were, well, not so nice, so how do you get the other two? We get the needed information to unlock these endings during the main quest. At some point we will enter lab X16 and at its very end we will find a corpse next to a controller. This corpse belongs to Ghost, a now former member of Strelok's group who has a voiced message that leads us to a quest back to the Cordon. Gone, I could really do with her help right now. When I get back from the mission, I'm gonna find the guy at the perimeter. He goes there a lot. And he may help me find Doc. And if Strelok's still alive, Doc will know for sure where to find him. Anyway, that's for later. And now I'm all alone. On this stinking underground mission. Vasiliev doesn't count, he's just a burden which I'll have to protect. Vasiliev lost it at the very last moment. And when the door opened, he ran off instead of deactivating the lower consoles. I shouldn't have relied on him. Strelok was right to mistrust those lying dogs. My only chance is to get to the door before the controller. This quest is optional and can be skipped, or worse, can be overlooked, and once you are at the power plant, there's no way to do this quest. Go back into the cordon and meet up with a stalker called Provodnik or the guide, which points in the direction of Strelok's hideout where the man called the doctor should be. 
So we travel to this place again too and get a few explanations. Hey, Strela! Strela, come on, man, wake up! Oh, this better. You had me worried. What the hell are you doing, man? Have you lost your memory or something? You were the one who suggested that we take this precaution. Oh well, at least you're... at least you're still alive. Look, Straylock, we've got no time, so I need you to listen to me. Everything you have said about the monolith is true. All of it. It is just an illusion manufactured in a lab next to the sarcophagus. And nobody, nobody who reached the monolith has ever come back. Looks like they have died there. But anyway, while you're away, I dug up some more info. And basically, there is a decoder to open the door which leads to the monolith controls. And this decoder is hidden in a stash and prepiant. Now I am going to give you the coordinates of this stash, and I'm giving you the key to open it. I want you to take the decoder, and I want you to find the door in the sarcophagus. And then you... Well, you'll know what to do. But it seems that this is the only way of uncovering the zone's real secret. This is the one you have been trying to work out, Strelok. If you didn't knew it until this point, now you know that the player character is Strelok. We also find out that the Wish Granter is a trap to divert Curious Stalker from the real secret of the zone. The Doctor also said that seemingly other Stalkers managed to get to the Wish Granter. I don't know if that's really true, but it would support my theory, at least partially, that the Wish Granter only affects and kills the person who expresses the wish and doesn't change anything beyond that. The way leads to Pripyat and room number 26 of a hotel where the needed decoder awaits and also some manuscripts written by Strelok that seem to contain some revealed secrets of the zone. Now you can start the final mission without any worries. You fight until you reach the stairs again, but this time you take a turn to the right. Though it doesn't really matter since you can just go around. When you go right and then take a turn to the left, you will eventually see a ladder to the left. This is marked by a rotating light above the door. At the end of the hallway is a large metal door, which can only be opened by the decoder. If you don't have it, the door stays closed and you can only get one of the wrong endings. But there's a little trick to glitch open the door. If you have a ghost rifle on you, which can be looted by some of the enemies that you have to defeat there. Throw it between the door hinges and with some luck the rifle gets stuck and the door opens. Once you use the decoder on the door, a timer starts to count down from 30 seconds. That's how long you have to survive the oncoming monolith fighters teleporting to your position. Either kill them or make a run for it once the door opens. Now you are in the cellar rooms and have to fight dozens of monoliths again until you get to a room with a holographic wish granter in the middle. You have to destroy the blue lights and shortly after the mission to find the wish granter fails. The holographic projection changes to a scientist who is part of the sea consciousness and you can ask him multiple question. questions. We find out that the zone was created during a failed experiment and they try to contain the spread and stabilize the zone since then. Individuals are unable to affect the noosphere. But see consciousness could. Unfortunately, we made a mistake, and our interference spawned the zone, which we had been trying to contain ever since. 
Strelok is offered to join the Sea Consciousness and support them in this endeavor, and the player gets the option to either agree or reject them. If you join us, we can restrict the zone's growth. If you decide otherwise, we cannot make a credible prognosis of the outcome. If you decide to join the Sea Consciousness, the following happens. seen Straylock in a long time. Is he dead already? Although he is hardy as a cat, he should be okay, I think. But well... Well, let's leave this place, pal. Let's have some dinner. I know that you are more interested in that than our old friend. You just see how Strelok gets into some kind of stasis pod and becomes part of the Sea Consciousness. And after that, the Doctor, who is worried about his whereabouts. The reason why Strelok decides to become part of the Sea Consciousness is to prevent the zone from expanding further. In the conversation before, we got told that the Sea Consciousness created the zone by accident. They say that they need Strelok's help to contain and stabilize the zone, but in the following sequence, in which the Doctor is worried about Strelok's whereabouts, you can see that nothing really changed. And since Strelok was away for multiple months once before, between the prequel Clear Sky and Shadow of Chernobyl, where he was brainwashed and programmed to become an agent of the zone, a significant amount of time must have passed. It's unclear why they haven't taken just any other person to, co to be connected to the Sea Consciousness. It could be that a person has to be a volunteer, like the seven people that originally created the Consciousness, and there wasn't anyone who would willingly be part of it. Or the person who becomes part of the Consciousness needs to have certain cognitive abilities, and Strelok has these. That's all just pure speculation though, and I couldn't find any hints if something of that could be true. Since the people that are part of the consciousness eventually die, Strelok might replace one who is already very weak, or he becomes the eighth person connected to it. Whatever the reason might be, the Sea Consciousness said that it stabilizes the zone. And we don't know if that really would have happened, because we only know that Strelok refused their offer. Should we decide not to be part of their game, we find ourselves at the bottom of some stairs that lead out of the room. Following these stairs we get out behind the power plant and make our way to the location of the Sea Consciousness. Since we want to destroy them, the Monolithians are still hostile and we have to shoot our way through them. For that we have to go through multiple portals that are spread all over the area and we even walk on the sarcophagus, the mantlet of metal that was built after the catastrophe in 1986 around the hole to prevent more radioactivity from leaking outside. Little fun fact on the side, around 2016 a new protective hole, the new safe confinements was built around the sarcophagus which was meant as a provisional solution and started to rust away. Since the radioactivity around the reactor was way too high, they had to put that thing together about 200 meters away and was then pushed over the old sarcophagus uh, via rails, which makes it the biggest mobile structure in the world. The mentioned portals are placed in a rather linear fashion, even if it looks arbitrarily when viewed from above. This means that you don't have to go on a wild hunt to find the right portal or feel like going in the circles because you seem to go through the same portal again and again. And once you reach the final portal, the end scene plays.
I don't know whether I was right or wrong. I guess I'll never know. But I made it. And I guess I should be thankful for that. Strelok destroyed the sea consciousness and asks himself if that was really the right decision. At least he's happy that he even made it at all, because after all the information you can get in Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky, it seemed that this has been his goal for a long time now, even before his amnesia. What we can be sure about is that this is the true ending that really happened. We know that because of the plot in Stalker Call of Pripyat, where we meet him at the end and leave the zone in an evacuation mission led by the military. Strelok passed on the information he obtained on his trip to the Chernobyl NPP to the USS commanders. This prompted the government to create a scientific institute for research of the Chernobyl anomalous area. Strelok took up the position of chief scientific consultant to the institute. Now we are done. All seven endings explained and as far as possible interpreted. This was a translation I did from my German video. As you may already noticed and an updated version from an old video I did some years ago. I tried to gather as much information as possible and create my own theories and not just tell what the official wiki page said. The bit of knowledge I had from the books were intentionally left out since a lot of stuff that happens in there is not compatible with what happens in the games. I don't know if the theories I made here are true or false. Maybe some of the stuff gets answered in Stalker 2 and maybe you guys have more ideas and theories or can find flaws in what I said. In any way I probably will have to update this video sometimes in the future with the new information. At last I want to thank you for watching and we see us in the zone. Bye.